I have the pleasure today of speaking with Dr. Laura Carsonson on emotion and aging. Dr. Carsonson is a professor of psychology and the Fairley Dixon Jr. Professor in Public Policy at Stanford University, where she's also the founding director of the Stanford Center on Longevity, which explores innovative ways to solve the problems of people over 50 and improve the well-being of people across all ages. She received her BS from the University of Rochester and PhD in clinical psychology from West Virginia University. Dr. Carsonson is best known in academia for the socio-emotional selectivity theory, a lifespan theory of motivation, and with her students and colleagues, has published well over 125 articles on lifespan development. Her research has been supported by the National Institute on Aging for more than 20 years, and in 2011, she authored A Long Bright Future, Happiness, Health, and Financial Security in an Age of Increased Longevity. She is a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science, the American Psychological Association, and the Gerontological Society of America. She has chaired two studies for the National Academy of Sciences, resulting in The Aging Mind and When I'm 64. She's a member of the MacArthur Foundation's Research on an Aging Society. Not surprisingly, Dr. Carsonson has won numerous awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship and the Distinguished Career Award from the Gerontological Society of America. So I now turn to our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Laura Carsonson on emotion and aging. So thanks for joining us today, Laura. Pleasure to be here. So what I would love to talk with you about to start things off is to hear a little bit about what first got you interested in emotion in the first place. Where did it all begin? Hmm. I um, began my research career expecting to study depression and anxiety in the elderly. Uh, the textbooks at the time and psychopathology were organized around chapters that went like uh, schizophrenia, anxiety, depression, old age. I mean, it was listed as a form of psychopathology. And, and the prevailing lore was that older people were very likely to be clinically depressed. And that was what I wanted to study, was the ways in which uh, the social world might actually contribute to these very high rates of depression in the elderly. And I went after that over and over again and studies that I conducted from my dissertation through several years after I was an assistant professor and the data just didn't support it. And in fact, the findings were contradicting that assumption in my own research. And around that same time, uh, the epidemiological catchment area study findings appeared and they had found lower rates of depression and anxiety and really every form of psychopathology, except for the dementias, at lower rates. And so lots of evidence was, was um, coming in suggesting that we were entirely wrong. Mm -hmm. And I began to think long and hard about how that could possibly be. So I'd love to hear then a bit about your research where you really have uncovered some mysteries about aging and emotion that I think to many people were not what they first expected or like you're saying was not in the tradition of uh, psychology and clinical psychological theories of emotional health. Um, so if we start there, I mean, we all have heard this expression that, you know, as we grow older, we grow wiser. Um, your work suggests that we may actually also grow happier, so to speak, as we age. So is it really true that older adults are happier compared to younger adults? Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that happy is probably too simplistic a term and that what happens instead as we grow older is that people come to realize that life does not go on forever, that there is a certain fragility to it, that none of us are gonna live forever. And what that means is that we understand that bad times will pass, uh, so will good times. And what that does, instead of making people morbid and uh, down and distressed, seems to help focus people on what matters most. Older people are, on balance, happier than younger people if we look at a ratio of positive emotions to negative emotions. But emotional life in old age is also more complex. There's more poignancy with age. So again, if you, if you look at your granddaughter uh, splashing in a puddle outside in a, in a rainstorm, 
Uh, you may smile out the window, but also have a tear in your eye. And we believe that that's because we recognize that time is fleeting. And it's in this temporal context that emotions develop in ways that are richer than anything I think we can imagine in childhood and very early adulthood. Do you think that we're also better able to manage or tolerate negative emotions as we grow older as well? It appears that that's the case. There are some data emerging suggesting that older people are more comfortable with sadness in particular. Uh, we see very low rates of anger uh, in old age and day-to-day -day life and very little fear, interestingly. Uh, but sadness does, does uh, continue to persist and uh, often accompany happiness. Uh, again, something that we would characterize as, as poignancy. It's so fascinating. I mean, what's interesting too here is that you've developed this concept, this widely known concept of socio-emotional selectivity theory, suggesting that as we age, we become increasingly selective and invest greater resources in emotionally meaningful goals and close relationships. So what are some of the most important discoveries here as you've advanced this theory through time? Mm. Uh, thank you. This, this is a theory that's fundamentally grounded in the human ability to monitor time, not just clock time and calendar time, which many other species also uh, manage, but lifetime. That is that we appreciate our own mortality in day-to-day -day life. We know we're not going to live forever at an intellectual level. And so we come to change our goals as we move through life. Uh, Socio-emotional selectivity th theory suggests that these differences that we observe are not truly age differences, but differences in time horizons. I would say that the most interesting or surprising findings that we have uncovered in my group are ones that show that younger people too show the same kinds of shifts and goals and motivation when they face upcoming endings or constraints on future time horizons. I think this has helped make the, the observations we see in older people make a lot more sense to people of all ages. You know, you say, well, how would you feel if you had another year left? Would you want to go to that cocktail party? Would you want to take a new course in, 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 in chemistry? Would you want to start a brand new friendship? And people all of a sudden shift and it's like, oh, yeah. So I think, I think because we found that younger and older people in under the same conditions uh, respond very similarly, I think that's helped people understand at a deeper, more personal level what may be happening and, and at older ages. And I think it also helps us see older people as, as people and not Martians. You know, I mean, somehow a lot of the research early on on aging uh, very much now in hindsight looks like a lot of young people studying a group of people they know nothing about. And that as we get older ourselves, we the research community in this topic of aging, uh, it begins to feel quite comfortable, quite normal, and not something that's so foreign. So it sounds like not only are we better un able to understand how emotional processes change through time, but actually better understand how, I don't know, how similar in many ways we are, you know, and there's continuity across the lifespan, that aging doesn't mean you become this categorically distinct exactly. being. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So one of the things I, I know that's also really interesting about many things you do here is looking at the kinds of judgments we make about our future emotional states, sort of how do we affectively forecast how we're going to feel in the future at a certain time or in response to a certain event, and that these kinds of affective forecasts really are important in guiding a lot of the decisions we make in our everyday life. And your work has looked at to what extent um, there might be age-related differences in how we sort of portray or predict our emotional future. And I wonder if you could say just a little bit about that. Do we change in the way we predict our future emotional selves as we grow older? Yeah, I completely agree with what you just said, June. It makes yeah. a lot of sense. Um, of course, you know, when we, when we begin to engage in a behavior, it's with some expectation. Um, and in fact, there are neural regions in the brain that appear to be dedicated to this, this anticipation of reward or an anticipation of risk. At some fundamental level, I think it, that is what motivation is, uh, what moves us to uh, behave in particular ways. We have discovered something we now call the positivity effect. Um, it's an effect uh, that's been replicated in many different labs around the world, and it's been shown in autobiographical memory, affective forecasting, 
um, a short-term memory, long-term memory, we see a, a, a differential emphasis or preference for positive information in relatively older than relatively younger mm -hmm. adults. So there seems to be some shift both in what we see, we hear, we remember, but also in what we expect, what we anticipate. And the older people get, it appears, the more likely they are to anticipate the positive, more the so than the negative. Interesting. So, I mean, thank you for answering all these questions about your research. When you think about sort of what got you started, a lot of the major discoveries you've done since then, as you look towards the future, <laughs> speaking of projecting forward, where do you sort of see the, the future of emotion headed? What, what is in store for this field in, from your perspective? I think we're beginning to uh, expect that understanding emotion is going to help us intervene in people's lives in very positive ways. And I don't really mean therapy here. I'm not talking about psychotherapy per se, but rather how can we um, activate individuals to engage in communities, to contribute their talents, to uh, live healthy lifestyles. And we are just beginning now to investigate, for example, how uh, positively framed messages seem to be more effective in motivating uh, good health behaviors in older adults than, say, negative uh, uh, messages. And so I think now what we're coming to in, in our research group, but also I think in the field, is how do we use this? What's the function of emotion and how might we positively influence older individuals in the worlds in which they live uh, by understanding what emotion does functionally? Thank you. So when you speak to students or you know, people interested in embarking in the study of emotion, what advice do you have for them, the sort of next generation of people who are going to continue to unearth some of these puzzles about emotion? Well, the, the best advice that I have is to listen to the data, look at the findings. Uh, and don't fight with them. Don't try to, you know, sort of concoct them or shape them into some form that matches your initial hypothesis, but let them surprise you. You know, it took me years to feel like I finally, you know, was, was, was able to see what the data were telling me. And as it turns out, it was a very different story than what I expected. You know, we as psychologists understand that theories and hypotheses, that expectations guide our attention and our ability to see. So our brains don't process information like computers evenly, but rather we're, we're directed by our goals or we're directed by our hypotheses. And the way that we should be approaching science is to do all we can to overturn our theories, to find ways to show that we were wrong. Because in showing where we're wrong, we move forward. And simply confirming what we think we already knew, we really don't move. And so that's, I think, the best advice I could give young scientists is to really critically question and be open to seeing whatever the data present. Mm. Thank you so much for that wonderful piece of advice. I think we could use it at, at all stages in our career. <laughs> it's been great talking with you. Yeah, thank you for speaking with us today, Laura. Um, this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Laura Carstensen from Stanford University.